much much ado, and uh, this guy has. You're gonna walk out of here with things that about alcohol that you probably never appreciated before. So, uh, Mr. Jim Manley. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, I've been doing this whiskey education stuff for about 10 years, and I'm an organizer of a little event that's it, it's called BSDC WTF. We've done about 10 of them now. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, I do work at a, a small distillery in, in, uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. So, um, so just oops, a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, there are exceptions to everything I'm about to tell you, okay? So it just that's just the way it works. If you have a question, um, Rather than holding it to the end, I don't mind if you interrupt me and ask it right, right then and there. I, I work much better in an interactive session than I do just standing up here spewing stuff. You've got to, because who knows, you may ask a question that, that I may not cover, and so I'd rather give you the information that you think you want to have versus just me telling, telling you a bunch of different things. So I, I mentioned B-Size Las Vegas 2011 is where this kind of all got started. Um, I had showed up with... Uh, it, it, it was at the Artisan, which is really kind of a spooky hotel if you've never been there before. But I'd showed up with uh, my magic schmoo bag, um, appropriately loaded, and we were sitting out on the back porch at the Artisan with, uh, I don't know, Quadling, Kick Froggy, Jedi, a bunch of people. And I was sharing stuff out of the bag with them and talking with them about all sorts of different things, production process and those types of things. And, and uh, Quadling started getting on my case about doing a talk, a whiskey talk, right? Doing a, you need to do a talk at a con, do a talk at a con. And, you know, and other than the fact that we all drink, um, I really couldn't come up with a good reason for why I would do a whiskey talk at a con. But then later on, um, at several of the DEF CON events I've been at, I've had several people who've been gone through the BSDC WTF activities come up to me and tell me that, hey, the stuff I learned at your talks um, has helped me in my business, in their business, particularly the, 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 the women who've attended the talks have been able to now, one of them told me she's actually can able, is able to hold her own with guys in whiskey discussions now because of the stuff that she's learned in the classes that I've done. Um, and I've actually used this knowledge on some social engineering engagements too. So uh, uh, Evan said, hey, you know, you might want to come to SkyDogCon. It's just quirky enough that you could actually do a talk there and it might actually be appreciated. So anyway, here I am. So whiskey with an E or whiskey without an E? Which is it, right? So this is kind of one of the great debates. Um, there are a lot of different theories out there about why it is the way it is. Uh, the one that I find to be probably the most credible is that in the late 19th century, um, uh, John Jameson, John Powers, and George Rowe, who were already big Irish whiskey distillers in their own right, were trying to figure out a way to differentiate their, um, uh, their swill or their, their whiskey from the swill that was coming from across the, uh, the Irish Sea out of Scotland at the time. And so they opted to say, well, you know, we're just going to change the spelling. We're going to add the E to whiskey. And uh, so at this point in the UK, the EU, and pretty much the rest of the world, there is no E in the, world, in the word whiskey. However, in Ireland and in the US, um, we do use the E. Now, that in the US, we use the E primarily because a lot of the distillers that originally came over into uh, the United States at the time were of Irish descent. So however, not universal. One of the largest whiskey makers in the United States does not put an E in whiskey. That's Maker's Mark. Um, of course, they attribute this to their Scottish heritage, so they're doing it that way. So classes of spirits. There are six classes of spirits. You've got your gins, which are essentially neutral grain spirits with aromatics added to them. You have vodkas, which are basically just neutral grain spirit. Um, vodkas can be made out of pretty much anything you can ferment, potatoes, wheat, cabbage, corn. Um, Russians were very inventive or very desperate, one of the two, not sure which. Um, <laughs> there are uh, rums, which are essentially distilled molasses, and then tequilas, which is blue agave, distilled blue agave from the Jalisco region down in Mexico, and brandies, which are distilled grapes. And then you have my favorite of all, whiskey. So what is whiskey? Well, everybody knows whiskey is sunshine held together by water, right? Uh, not really. Uh, whiskey is, a, is basically anything. It's a, it's a distilled a spirit distilled from a mash of cereal grains. Uh, that's that's the general big broad definition. Um, more precisely, in the U.S., uh, that's the actual definition. Um, I'm not going to read it to you, but the key things are: it has to be less than 190 proof. Uh, has to possess the taste, aroma, and characteristics generally attributed to whiskey. Circular definition. Um, stored in a new oak container, except for corn whiskey, which doesn't have to be stored that way, and, and bottled less than 80 proof. So 
So bourbon, probably a, the, this is the, referred to as, as America's native spirit. Um, it, is, uh, it actually enjoys a, a international protection in the, in the fact that bourbon can only be produced in the United States. Okay. Now, big myth here, myth, 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 myth buster. You don't have to distill bourbon in Kentucky. It doesn't have to come from Bourbon County. In fact, there are no distilleries in Bourbon County. Bourbon County is a dry county. So, yeah, Bourbon County is a dry county. In Bourbon County? Okay, well, that's new then. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard that, but yeah, yeah. Again, dry county can't can't distribute, can't sell, right? So, um, bourbon has a very specific definition. The the biggest item being that it's, it's a minimum of 51% corn in the mash bill. Bourbon typically is or will consist of three grains: corn, um, a flavoring grain, which will either be rye or wheat, and then uh, malted barley. So, but 51% corn uh, has to be stored for a period of time in a new charred American oak barrel. Now there is no age requirement for bourbon. All right, I tell people at the distillery, I could take, go over to the receiver, I could pull bourbon, or pull the, the, the new make spirit out of the receiver, dump it in a barrel, swish it around, put it in a bottle, and that's bourbon. Okay, not any bourbon anybody want to drink. Good, good for stripping paint, but that's about it. So, and it also has to be bottled at a minimum of 40% of uh, alcohol by volume or 80 proof. So uh, Tennessee whiskey. Tennessee whiskey is essentially bourbon, okay? Same, same style, same mash bill, except in 2013, the Tennessee state legislature came up with a designation that says, if you want to write Tennessee whiskey on the bottle, you have to go through what is known as the Lincoln County process. And the Lincoln County process is nothing more than taking the new make spirit that comes off the still, filtering it through a charcoal filter before you put it in the, before you barrel it up, okay? Uh, the Lincoln County process was actually developed by Jack Daniels Distillery when, when the distillery was located in Lincoln County. Now, oddly enough, there are no distilleries in Lincoln County. Now, actually, the, the Jack Daniels didn't move. They just moved the county around, around it, so. Um, oddly enough, you're less than three years in the barrel. You have to put it on the bottle. Actually, it's less than four. Yeah, less than four, so. Um, there are rye, rye, wheat, and corn whiskeys. They all follow the same basic definition as bourbon. Um, the grain content for whatever grain that happens to be has to be at least 51 percent. And uh, and with the and the, for corn whiskey, there's no storage requirement for corn whiskey. Basically, that corn whiskey can come right straight out of the receiver, go right straight into the bottling tank, and and be bottled um, as is. And we have Canadian whiskeys from our our cousins up north. Um, Canadian whiskeys are typically a blended multi-grain whiskey that has a really high corn content that makes it real light in spirit and flavor. Um, and early on, the Canadians figured out that if they threw, a, if they threw rye into the, into the mash, it would actually make a very tasty whiskey. And at that point in time, this was back in the 1800s, the, the Canadians started referring to whiskey as just rye whiskey. So it's, uh, it can be confusing as to whether it's a big rye or a little rye. In, in Canada today, if you go to Canada and ask for rye whiskey, you'll get Canadian whiskey. They, they, they don't differentiate between the two. Um, as far as its definition, it just, it's pretty much like the rest of them. It has to be done and can't, has to be made in Canada. Um, there's, it, it does have a three-year age requirement on it. It has to be aged for at least three years. It doesn't have to be new wood. can be used barrels. Um, they can add caramel coloring to it and bottled it uh, at least 80 proof. Um, the production process for Canadian whiskey is a little different than it is in the U.S. as well. In the U.S., we'll mash all the grains together and then ferment and distill that. In Canada, they'll mash the grains separately. They'll distill them separately, bottle or age them separately, and then it's not until they come time, it's time to bottle that they actually mix the, mix the separate grains together and bottle that. Uh, if they feel like it gives them much more control over the flavor profile. Um, there is this interesting thing called the 9.09% rule with respect to whiskey that comes from Canada into the United States, and that's basically that, that whiskey can have up to 9% of other components in it. It doesn't have to be 100% Canadian whiskey. The reason that's done is because the, the United States actually gives Canada a break on tariffs if they incorporate some amount of, of, of an American product into a Canadian product. So what the Canadians do is they'll go out and they'll buy bourbon from you know, from the U.S., and then they'll dump, you know, a teaspoon or some amount of, of uh, bourbon into their Canadian whiskey so that they can claim this tax incentive when they, when they sell it to the U.S. 
Scotch whiskey styles. The Scotch have two basic. Uh, the, the Scots have two basic whiskey styles. Um, there's a, a malt whiskey, which is essentially 100% malted barley, and then a blended whiskey, which is a blend of malted barleys and uh, or malted whiskeys and grain whiskeys. Now, when you see the term single, like in a single malt whiskey, this is a whiskey that's 100% malted whiskey. Single refers to the fact that it's one distillery. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's 100% malt. It has to do with the fact that all this comes from a single distillery. Um, grain whiskeys are the same way. A grain whiskey can be any grain, um, typically anywhere from 60 to 80% of, of any grain plus 20 to 40% malted barley. Uh, again, all coming from a single distillery. Then you have a blended malt whiskey. This was a traditional style of whiskey in Scotland um, up until the early 1900s. Uh, and this was essentially where you would take, the blender would take whiskeys that came from, single malt whiskeys that came, come from several different distilleries and blend them all together. And then that was what they would bottle would be, so it would be a blend of several different malt whiskeys. Um, now today is blended scotch whiskey. This is the predominant whiskey on the market. If you buy scotch today, it will, will be a blended scotch. Um, anywhere from 90 to 95% of the market today is, is blended scotches. Um, so, single malts have a very peculiar definition. Again, produced and matured 100% in Scotland, can consist of only three ingredients, water, malted barley, and yeast. Um, they have to be distilled at less than 94.8% alcohol by volume. Um, you'll see 94.8% alcohol by volume in a lot of definitions, and there's a reason for that. It's primarily to go above that, that strength, you actually have to go into a vacuum still. You cannot, you cannot get above 94.8% alcohol by volume in, in, a, in an open air, non-pressurized still. So uh, that's why you'll see it definitely. A matured in an oak cask, again, not, not, scotch does not require new oak. You can go into used barrels. In fact, most of the bourbon barrels that are used and dumped in the United States end up going to Scotland because a bourbon barrel can only be used once to produce bourbon. Um, those barrels will end up going to the going over to to the uh, to the UK and, and where they they're broken down and, and rebuilt into a little bit larger size barrel and used for storing uh, Scotch whiskey. No added substances other than water and plain caramel coloring and then again bottled at no less than 40% ABV. All right, so Irish whiskeys um, again, pretty much the same definition has to be produced in Ireland. Uh, has to be aged at least three years, distilled at less than 94.8% by volume. Now, in addition to single malt whiskeys and blended malt whiskeys and, and blended Irish whiskeys, the Irish have a, a very unique style called a single pot still whiskey. And this originated in, in the 19th century when the English started to tax the Irish on the amount of malted barley that was going into their whiskey. So the Irish, in typical Irish style, flipped the English, the bird, and started and changed up in their mash bills. Instead of using 100% malted barley, they started mixing malted barley with unmalted barley. And it resulted in a style of whiskey called single pot still. And that's been uh, probably one of the predominant sellers today is the single pot still style of whiskey. Uh, another peculiar thing about Irish whiskey is most Scotch whiskeys are double distilled. So they run these two separate stills. Irish whiskeys are actually triple distilled. They'll go through a, a still three times in order, and that's, again, the idea is to, to create a very high alcohol content, which results in a much lighter, um, uh, airier whiskey. Moonshine. Moonshine is one of my pet peeves because the, def the legal definition of moonshine is, is um, basically any grain spirit in which the taxes have not been paid, okay? So it's untaxed which makes it illegal, all right? So this stuff that you see in the store is not technically not moonshine, okay? It's just an unaged, typically it's an unaged corn-based spirit, Imposters. okay? Yeah, Imposters, exactly. Now, I don't know how many of you know Chris Hadnagy, the human hacker, okay? Chris is, I mean, moonshine has gotta be one of his favorite things. So if you really wanna get on Chris's good side, get him a bottle of moonshine. He'll, he'll love you forever for it. <laughs> After we get done here, uh, I'll, I'll give you Chris's. Everybody actually stop, take a picture. Yeah. I'm serious. Take, take your phone back. Give me a huge favor. Take your phone. Take a picture of this. Now tag him on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. He's also like our biggest sponsor this year, by the way. So it's a great way to say thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I did I did warn him that I was gonna do this, so yeah. Anyway, yeah. That picture? Yeah. Not really, no. <laughs> I did tell him he was going to he was going to figure prominently in the talk. Well, I, I may just okay. I'm going to have some special stuff. I'll have it up here in a moment. We can all. Laugh. <laughs> all right. So, so other types of whiskey. You have white whiskeys, which is essentially an unaged uh, spirit that's been diluted down and uh, bottled for sale. And then there's these things, these flavored whiskeys. Yeah. Um, this, these, these are abominations as far as I'm concerned. Um, essentially, a flavored whiskey is a whiskey that's, after it's been aged, it's infused with some kind of flavor, whether that's honey or, or cinnamon or, I don't know, skunk pea, whatever it is. Just, it's, these, are not, not, these are not good things as far as I'm concerned. Um, then there's all these things that are not whiskey, okay? So flavored moonshines typically are not considered whiskeys because if you look at the alcohol content on them, they only run anywhere from 20 to 30% alcohol by volume, so they don't actually meet the requirement to be considered a, a whiskey. Um, a lot of moon, quote, moonshines that you see in the store are not, based, not, not grain-based. They're actually called, they're sh based on sugar, so they basically they refer to them as sugar shines where they've taken a, basically a pot of water and dumped a bunch of sugar in it and then fermented that and distilled it and called it moonshine. Um, a lot of liqueurs and cordials, like Southern Comfort or Irish Mist, are not considered to be whiskeys because they don't they don't meet the legal requirements um, for that. And then there's this stuff, which uh, obviously not a whiskey. I I found this somewhere. You know, it's like alcohol-free flavored whiskey drink. Yeah, beats the shit out of me. Okay. Does it get you drunk? <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, whiskey producing countries. So there's like 23 countries today in the, today that produce country or that produce uh, whiskeys. Scotland is by far the largest uh, producer. Um, I think last year they they exported in 2014. Scotland exported the equivalent of 333 Olympic size swimming pools of whiskey in one year. That's, that's nine million cases or something like that. Um, I, 915 plus active distilleries. I, have, I, I can no longer keep up with how fast distilleries are popping up in Scotland. Um, when I first started doing these talks, there was 99. Now we're up to 115. Um, the United States has over 500 active distilleries. All right, you can buy, you can go and find a distillery in every state in the in the union, and in Washington D.C. Where there are actually two distilleries actually inside of D Washington D.C. today. Um, Third largest producer, believe it or not, is Japan. They have nine active distilleries in Japan. I've been to seven of the nine, um, and uh, they produce a really, really nice whiskey in Japan. Um, Ireland, uh, Ireland, pre-prohibition, Ireland had more distilleries than Scotland. They had somewhere in the neighborhood of about 200 distilleries, and uh, prohibition pretty much wiped them out. At the end of prohibition, when they came out of prohibition, they had three active distilleries. They're back up to 12 now. Uh, then there's the rest of the world, Canada, India, Europe, Taiwan, Australia, Tasmania, Belgium. Uh, uh, there's, again, all of distilleries from all over the place. Uh, so some things you're going to run, some terms you'll run across, uh, distillers, NDPs, and independent bottlers. All right, so distiller is pretty obvious. So distiller is somebody who has a license and actually distills. The distiller will have something called a DSP number, okay, distilled spirits producer license. The distillery I work at, our number is... DSP TX 15032, have to stamp it on every barrel that we produce. Um, distillers will also usually put things like uh, distilled by with the address where they're from, okay, the address of the distillery, uh, or they'll say distilled in uh, on their packaging. They're very proud of that. Um, and they'll either be a branded house or a house of brands. And by a branded house, it's something like a Maker's Mark. Everything that Maker's Mark produces is it's Maker's Mark something. Okay. How many of you ever heard of a story called Heaven Hill? A few of you, right? So Heaven Hill is what's called a house of brands. Um, Heaven Hill doesn't actually produce a whiskey that says Heaven Hill on it. Okay. They produce whiskeys that are for like Evan Williams and Elijah Craig and Parker's, you know, Parker's Heritage, those types of things. So they're, again, they produce, they're a big house that produces a lot of different brands. Non-distiller producers, these guys are the, well, no, I'm not say that. What these guys do is they source spirit from other distilleries, and then they bottle it and market it as their own brand, okay? Now, um, 
So they're not necessarily always clear about things. So for instance, if you pick up a bottle of whistle pig rye, and you look at that bottle, you'll swear to God that, that rye was made in, at the whistle pig farms in Vermont. That bottle of whiskey, that whiskey in that bottle is 100% Canadian whiskey that was made by Alberta distillers in Canada. Trucked into whistle pig farms so that they can bottle it up and sell it themselves. Right? NDPs will typically put things on there like produced by or handcrafted by or uh, produced in, but they won't put distilled on the bottle unless they say distilled by and they name the distillery. Okay, that's the only way they can put distilled by in the bottle. And of course, they're not always very truthful either. Bullet bourbon. If you uh, call Lawrence, <clears throat> Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, and say, please give me the address of the bullet distillery, they won't be able to because there is no such thing as a bullet distillery. It doesn't exist. Uh, bullet actually, there all of the bullet bourbon was actually produced by Four Roses and bottled by the bullet distilling company and sold. Yeah. Anyway, um, unfortunately, if you pick up a bottle of bullet, it'll in, it'll say distilled by, which is a flagrant violation of the law. But the TTC who keeps up or the TTB who keeps up with all this stuff is is. The drone guy this morning was talking about enforcement. Well, TTB is not an enforcement board. They don't have an enforcement arm. So, you know, it, the, we as an industry are supposed to self-police. Um, and that, more and more that's happening because uh, some guys have been caught and been tagged. So, for instance, Templeton has now had to set up a $2.5 million fund to, to pay the people who bought Templeton rye six bucks a bottle um, up to $36 because of basically they got they got challenged in court and uh, were fined for mislabeling their bottles. So, all right, uh, last one is independent bottlers. Uh, independent bottlers, these, these, are, these are the offshoot of the whiskey brokers of old. Back in the 18th and 19th century, early 19th century, when you wanted to buy whiskey, you just didn't run down to the local package store. Um, you actually had to go into a storefront. Well, that store owner, whether it's a grocery store or a pub, <laughs> would go to a whiskey broker to buy, a, literally buy a full barrel of whiskey. And then that's what you went, you brought your own container down and you gave it to them and they filled it up for you and you went on about your business. Um, these brokers eventually started bottling, their, uh, bottling whiskey on their own and labeling those bottles. And when they did, they actually labeled it um, with the actual name of the distillery. So it was much more open and honest than we see with a lot of the NDPs today. Um, today, independent bottlers will source whiskey from other distilleries. They will then um, they'll do several different things. If it's if it's a raw spirit, they'll source it, they'll rack it themselves, and put it in their own warehouses and age it, and eventually get it to the point where they're ready to bottle it. Um, if it's a, if it's an aged spirit, they might do some enha enhancements, like re-rack it into a, a, a different style of a barrel, let it age for a little bit longer, and eventually get around to selling it. But the thing is, is they, they bottle it under their own label, but they're very clear about who the distillery is on the bottle. So you can always find out exactly where it is your, the whiskey that you're drinking came from. So a little bit about the equipment necessary to actually distill a whiskey. First thing you need is a mill. A mills are used to basically grind up the grains into, um, to create the mash. A uh, couple different types of mills that are used to, in the market today. There's one called a hammer mill, which is exactly what it sounds like consists of a bunch of pistons that come down and smash the grain. Um, hammer mills are not real popular because they, a couple things, they don't give you much control over the, the size of the particulate matter that you want to generate. The other thing is they generate a lot of heat, and heat can scorch the, the grain. If you scorch the grain, that taste shows up in the whiskey. The other type of mill on the market is called a roller mill, and it's exactly what it sounds like. You have a couple rollers in that you can set the, you set the depth of the rollers, um, and the grain passes through the rollers where it gets crushed. Now, in the, one of the roller mill designers came up with a little ingenious design. In addition to the rollers, he actually put striations on the roller so it's got ridges on it. So in addition to actually crushing the grain when it passes through the rollers, it shears it, creating much more surface area. And we're, we're, we want the surface area because later on in the cooking process, that helps to draw starches. Next thing you need is a cooker, or uh, in, the, in the English, or the Scotch parlance, it's called a mash tun. This is an example of about a 100-gallon cooker that you'd like find in a micro distillery. This is a 25,000 liter mash tun uh, that was in a distillery in Japan. Uh, so you can, again, these are where you used to cook, to actually cook the grains. Um, 
once you've got the grains cooked, you need some sort of fermentation tank to put them in a fermentation vessel. Uh, again, we call them we call them tanks the, in the in the Scotch parlance. They so call them a washback. Um, these are large, can be large vessels that are either closed, uh, and like this big stainless steel tank is, or they can be open to open to the air like these old wooden old wooden washbacks are. Um, next thing you need is a still. Okay, this is, a, this is the business end of the deal. Um, stills basically can come in different styles. Uh, there are pot stills, and these are a couple of different uh, pot stills that are um, in a distillery in Japan. These, uh, typically when you find pot stills, particularly for the production of scotch or any type of malt whiskey, you'll find them in pairs. They come, uh, you'll have a, what's referred to as a, as a wash still or a stripping still and then a spirit still. The reason for two different st types of stills is because in the pot still, process, you cannot generate enough alcohol with one run. You have to run it twice in order to get the alcohol content high enough. Um, second type of still is what you'll typically find in a bourbon distillery in the U.S. or in a grain distillery. It's called a column still. It's also known as a coffee still, a continuous still, or a patent still. Uh, coffee still was named after the, Anias Coffee was the guy who, uh, he was a Scotsman who actually uh, designed this thing uh, back in the 1800s. Column stills will typically be anywhere from 24 to 48 inches in diameter and 30 to 60 feet tall. All right. It's referred to as a continuous still because once the still's been charged and balanced, as long as you squirt your mash in at the top of the still and steam in at the bottom of the still, it'll produce whiskey. Okay, you never have to turn it off as long as you can keep it going. All right. or as opposed to a pot still, which is a batch, batch device. You load it up with uh, your mash, you run it one time, then you got to stop, clean it out, and reload it, and do it all again. A lot of micro distilleries will go to have gone to what are known as a hybrid still. Okay, this is a this is a combination of a pot on the bottom and a column on the top. This is actually one of the stills out of the place I work. A little 500 gallon job. Um, kind of gives you the best of both worlds. You get some of the benefits that, that are, are known to come with a pot still. Um, plus that you get the doubling effect or tripling effect of the column on the top in order so that we only have to do a single run every time we run we want to do this. Almost all stills you'll find in the market today are made of copper. And they're made of copper because the copper actually interacts with the spirit and pulls sulfites and other impurities out of the spirit during the, the distillation process. So once you got everything distilled and bought or, uh, barreled up, you got to have a place to put it. Uh, warehouses typically uh, are either will be a Dunnage type warehouse, that's what, you would, is what you'll find in the UK. Um, these will be essentially uh, stone buildings, dirt floors, single story, uh, no windows, not a lot of room for air movement in the thing. Uh, you go to Kentucky or here and Tennessee and you'll find these big behemoths that look like something out of Noah's Ark. Okay. These things are multi-story. Um, they will, uh, they'll be designed to either hold barrels in, in large racks like this or they'll be designed to hold barrels on pallets. Um, now one thing that's universal about most of these warehouses, there is no temperature control in the warehouse. Okay, and that's because we want to see temperature cycles, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Um, the only temperature control I'm aware of in any of the warehouses or some of the warehouses in Kentucky actually have a heating system in it, but that's just in there to keep the sprinkler pipes from freezing up. And that's the only reason they're there. So, um, Got to have a bottling line, and uh, this is another place where things get weird between the U.S. and the, and the rest of the world. There are lots and lots and lots of whiskeys out there that never make their way into the United States for the simple fact that they bottle using a 700 milliliter bottle and in the U.S. we're required to bottle using a 750 milliliter bottle. So a lot of places don't want to go to the expense of having to be able to set up two separate bottling lines or to be able to deal with two, handle two different sizes of bottles. So works both ways. Well, not a lot of, there's a lot of whiskeys that are in the U.S. that people overseas that would like love to get their hands on, but the, the, the distillers and the bottlers here are not willing to go put in a 700 milliliter bottling line. All right, so what's it take to make a whiskey? Well, you need cereal grains. This could be barley, corn, wheat, rye, oats, millet, sorghum. I've even seen um, whiskeys made with triticale, which is a wheat-rye hybrid, and, uh, and quinoa. Do anybody know what quinoa is? Yeah. It's a, yeah. Okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Actually, when I mentioned this, I, I have, in, in, in the, the, some of the groups I, I deal with, um, I have Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish attendants, and 
Um, when I started talking about the quinoa whiskey, they got pretty excited because during Passover, there's certain restrictions that they have about some of the, the spirits that they can use during Passover. And, and uh, anyway, uh, and Spam, Spam was pretty excited about it because he thought this was a, qu a quinoa whiskey is one they might actually be able to use uh, during the Passover. Second thing you need to have is yeast, um, and that's not just any yeast. It has to be a distiller's yeast uh, designed to take the, the temperatures and the alcohol con concentrations um, that are, occur in a fermentation tank. And the yeast can come in a couple different f uh, forms. They can, they can be powdered yeast. They can come as a pre-moistened cake. Most of the time, they'll come as a slurry. Now, prior to Prohibition, pretty much every distil distillery had their own yeast. Prohibition thank you very much, wiped out a lot of those yeast cultures. So now most of the yeast that a distiller will use will come from a large laboratory. Uh, yeast is important in the, uh, in the production process, primarily because of what it brings to the whiskey. 25% of your flavor profile is gonna come from the yeast. Yeast is responsible for the floral notes that you get on a whiskey and for the, fruit, the fruity things that you'll taste in a whiskey. All, that is all, all comes from the yeast. Of course, you obviously have to have water. Um, can't do much without the water, and then you got to have wood in the form of a barrel to put the uh, the, the product in once you've got finished your distillation run. Um, and then I mentioned you got to have heat. All right, uh, heat's necessary for the aging. So to kick all this process off, we start with a process called malting, where we actually malt barley. Now we use barley's used because it, it contains alpha and beta amylase enzymes that are necessary for the conversion of starch into sugar. Okay. They also have enzymes in that will help break proteins down into a, a product that uh, a, the yeast can actually metabolize. Throughout this whole process, we're after sugar, okay? And sugar feeds the yeast. So to malt barley, essentially what you'll end up doing is you take the barley after it's dried, uh, uh, you'll soak it, steep it in water two or three times until you get it good and wet, and then you spread it out on a malting floor. Um, where you'll keep it, continue to keep it moist and you'll continue to turn it over, the idea is you want to get the barley to germinate. Once the barley germinates, it, 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 that process creates all these additional enzymes that you're looking for. Um, after about three to five days, it started to germinate. You've got to stop the germination process. Uh, that's typically done with heat. So you, if you're looking for, uh, if in large, uh, large operations, what they'll do is they'll, sh they'll shuttle all that barley into a large kiln and then dry it in the kiln, which stops the germination process. If you want to make a peated whiskey, okay, then things get a little different. All right? to, to make a peated whiskey, you, you dry the barley using peat smoke. And so the, the uh, malting floors are designed such that they have, they've got uh, channels underneath them, and, and the smoke will, you can push the smoke up, and it passes upwards through the barley. And then the phenols that are in the peat smoke will attach themselves to the barley. And that, that comes out in the whiskey, and that's what creates the smoky the smoky flavors that you get in a in a multi in a excuse me in a in a peated barley. Um, so got to have a mill next to grind up the the grain. We talked a little bit about that. Um, again, the point of grinding the grain is to create surface area. The more surface area you can create, the more interaction there can be with the, the enzymes in the water in order to dry out starches and sugars. Um, next step is cooking or mashing. Um, this usually takes place in a in a large cooker or some sort. Again. You'll dump the grain, you'll start putting the grain in, you bring the temperature of the water up. Typically during the mashing process, you'll set temperatures at a couple, there'll be about three different temperature sets. Because what we found is that different grains will respond to different temperatures when it comes to being able to extract sugars and fermentables and the uh, this water-soluble starches out. Uh, once you're done with the fermentation, or the uh, the mashing process, everything cools down, then you pitch the yeast and you go into the fermentation tanks. Now, fermentation is, is the metabolic process by which the yeast converts sugar into acids, gases, and alcohol. All right. um, the alcohol we're after is obviously ethanol. The gas that comes off is carbon dioxide. Uh, this shot is a picture of one of our tanks where I'd actually pulled the grain cap back to be able to expose the liquid underneath. And, and what you see there is that's, that's actually carbon dioxide bubbling up off the, uh, uh, off, off the tank. Um, Now, if, you, if you've heard the term sour mash, sour mash is a, is a process whereby you, you, at the end of the fermentation process, you capture some of the mash that you've, you've, you're finished with and actually put it into the next batch of mash that you want to run uh, in order to basically, it helps kickstart the fermentation process as well as it helps balance out the acidity of the, of the new mash. 
Once you're done with this process, you have something called distiller's beer. Distiller's beer is essentially anywhere from 7 to 11 percent alcohol by volume. Um, it uh, tastes pretty nasty and uh, not something you actually want to ever try to drink. At this point, you're ready to transfer into distills. Um, different distilleries do it different ways, how they, how they run the transfers. We transfer everything into our pot stills. Okay, so we send mash, liquid, the whole batch all goes into the pot still. Larger distilleries that use column stills have to filter out the mash, have to filter out the particulate matter in the mash. That can be done in the, in the mash, in the, actually in the fermentation vessel itself. Uh, some of them have false bottoms on them that you can actually drain, drain the liquid off, and the, the particulate matter actually set, acts as a filter, sets up like a sand screen, so that what they pull off is basically a clear liquid. So distillation is essentially mechanical separation. You have ethanol that boils at 175, 174 degrees. You have water that boils at 212. We want ethanol, we don't want water. So the objective is to keep the still somewhere between 70, 174 degrees and 212 degrees. Now, not everything that comes off the still is something you want to drink, OK? <laughs> that first, the first batch of stuff that comes off the still, we, we call heads, or Scots call them faint, or four shots. Um, are light, real lightweight alcohols and uh, things like methanol and other compounds like acetone that will kill you if you drink them. So we don't want those. All right, so what we'll typically do is the still operator will, during the initial part of the run, will set up this, the uh, switching configuration on the receiver to capture the, the, the heads into a separate tank. But for us, about 20 minutes into the distillation run, the character of the spirit starts to change and we start getting what we're looking for in terms of uh, what we know is the right, the right characteristics for, our, for the spirit we're after. Um, again, change the configuration on the receiver so that we start capturing that. It's referred to as the heart of the run, and we'll capture that in a separate tank. Uh, that'll go on for us anywhere from th three hours to four hours. And then we start getting into the tail end of the run. And the tail end of the run, you get into things called fusel oils. They're not actually oils. They're just large chain alcohol molecules. Um, but again, not something you want in the spirit because my description of fusel oils and the heavier alcohols is it's, they, they taste and smell like the inside of an old dirty gym locker. So again, not something you want to have in your whiskey. So we'll capture those and, and set them aside. In some instances, we will actually uh, we'll take those heads and tails, once we get about 750 gallons of them, recombine them and, and go back and redistill them. And what we found is we can actually pull about uh, another 120 some odd gallons of, of good spirit out of the, the heads and the tails because of the, the, the cut process is not real well defined. Um, so uh, with respect to runs, like I mentioned earlier, pot sales, you typically have to do two runs. You have to do your stripping run and your spirit run. And then, uh, um, all right, aging. Uh, I get a lot of questions about aging and maturation. There's a lot of stuff going on in the market today about people trying to speed up the aging process. Uh, pardon? Well, my, my experience so far is it's all patently bullshit. Okay, a aging is called aging for a reason. It takes time. Okay, um, you could spend a whole day on talking about the impact of the wood that has on on the whiskey. If yeast is responsible for 25% of the flavor profile, the wood's responsible for anywhere from 60, 50 to 60% of the flavor profile. Uh, American oak, the, the type of wood that we use, there are over 130 different flavor compounds that have been identified in there. So things like vanilla, caramel, chocolate, um, leather, ash, the actual oak itself, all those flavors that you pick up in a whiskey all come from the wood. So. Uh, Barrels are typically charred. Now, you char a barrel for a couple reasons. Number one is, is that the char, charring actually creates a charcoal barrier between the whiskey and the, actual, and, the, and the rest of the wood. So as the whiskey passes through that charcoal barrier, it acts just like a charcoal filter. Right? The other reason for charring it is that charring busts up the capillary surface of the wood, allows the whiskey to go deeper into the wood, and then it also caramelizes the wood sugars and makes them available to the whiskey. There is a ton of chemistry that goes on inside the barrel, um, and it, like I said, you could go on for days about the, the impact that the barrel has. Charring levels will, will be anything from a toast, which is essentially where they'll raise the temperature inside the barrel to about 450 degrees. It doesn't actually burn the wood, it just toasts the wood. 
all the way up to what's called a four plus, which is a, also known as the alligator char because the inside of the barrel looks like an alligator skin. Um, four plus, typically the, the barrel will sit on the burner for, 40, for about 55 seconds. So the, when they kick the barrel off, the, actual, the, barrel, the inside of the barrel is actually on fire. They gotta, they gotta squirt them, spray them, knock them to knock, knock the flame down. So I mentioned there's no heating typically in a warehouse. That's because we're looking for temperature cycling. Um, the temperature cycling is necessary to draw the whiskey into the wood. So during the summertime when things are hot, the barrels expand, the whiskey gets drawn into the wood where it has a chance to do all of that nice chemical interaction that goes on. During the wintertime, the barrels will contract, pushes the whiskey that's in the wood back out into the, into the center of the, of the barrel where it gets to mix with all the whiskey that wasn't fortunate enough to get drawn into the wood. Um, and that, that cycle goes back and forth several times. Uh, the staves on a barrel will typically be about an inch thick. The whiskey, if you, if you take, an independent, take a stave out and look at it, the whiskey line, which is with the, the indication of how far into the barrel the whiskey is gone, the whiskey line will typically be about three quarters of an inch. So the whiskey is drawn with three quarters of the way into the, into the stave. Um, all this temperature cycling back and forth also results in evaporation, okay? And the term we use for it in the industry is angel share. Um, and so, and so every time the barrel expands, we lose whiskey. When the barrel contracts, we lose whiskey. It gets hot, we lose whiskey. Uh, nothing you can do about it. It's, you just, it's what you give up. In Scotland, it's one to three percent. In Texas, it's anywhere from three to five percent. If you go to India, they're screwed over there because it's anywhere from eight to twelve percent. Um, yeah. And uh, the term angel share actually comes from Scotland. And if you ask a Scottish distiller what the, you know why it's called the angel share, and they'll tell you that basically the angel share is the amount of whiskey that gets taken out of the barrels by the angels for allow, as a result of God teaching man how to make whiskey. So, um, after the aging is done, you'll end up taking the, the barrels, dumping them into a, a barreling or into the, a blending tank where you'll uh, let them basically marry up for a bit. Um, and then uh, they'll be ready to go into to filtration. Now there's a couple different types of filtration. Basically one is particulate matter. Um, when they dump the barrels, a lot of that charcoal that's on the inside of the barrels will end up, you know, flakes off and ends up being in the whiskey, so you have to filter that out. And there's another type of filtration called chill filtration. Now, whiskeys that are less than 40, 46% alcohol by volume tend to cloud when they get cold, all right? And that cloudiness comes from the fact that some of the long chain molecules, alcohol molecules in the whiskey start to clump together. Um, it doesn't impact the flavor of the whiskey, but it does impact the visual appeal. So to keep that from happening, what a lot of bottlers or distillers will do is they'll actually go through a chill filtration process where they'll take the whiskey, drive the temperature down to about two degrees centigrade, run it through a real fine steel mesh filter, and uh, then bottle it. So it, that's for, for well, Now, what about uh, single, like a lot of the stuff that's out now is like single cast or whatever. We'll get to that, yeah. That's, that's a little different, yeah. Yeah, Devil's Cut, that's a marketing. It's pure marketing, yeah. So it's just a play on words, yeah. Well, I don't doubt that it tastes good. I'm just telling you, it's just a, it's a marketing thing, right? Yeah, so um, anyway, then you're ready to go off to bottling. So now you've got your bottle of whiskey. Um, you ask about the labeling, all right? So um, there are certain things that are required to be on the label. Address of the distillery, at least the city and state has to be on there. There's the ubiquitous health warning about drinking while you're pregnant. Um, alcohol content has to be on the bottle. And then there's an, if it's underaged American whiskey, there needs to be a statement on there of how old the whiskey is. The gentleman said, you know, mentioned that, yeah, if it's an American whiskey, if it's under, under four years of age, if it's been aged for less than four years, you have to, somewhere on the bottle, they have to tell you what the age is. And a little bit more about age statements. Age statements are the, is the age of the youngest whiskey in the bottle, okay? When, when, a, when they go to bottle up whiskey, scotches or bourbons, whatever they are, they're pulling barrels from the warehouse, and those barrels can be different ages because they're looking for a specific flavor profile, so they're going to go after different barrels to, in order to create that flavor profile. The age statement on the bottle will be the age of the youngest barrel that they pulled, so if you go out and buy a 12-year-old single malt scotch, that single malt scotch has whiskeys in it that are at least 12 years old. And some of the malts I'm aware of have whiskeys in them that are as old as 40 years old in that 12-year-old scotch. So something to be aware of. Uh, 
And proof versus ABV. Um, in the U.S., we still use the term proof a lot. Um, it's basically, in, in it, for us, it, proof is essentially twice the al alcohol by volume. Everywhere else in the world, it, they use alcohol by volume. The uh, interesting thing about where the actual term proof came from um, is originated in the 16th century when the British Navy paid their sailors. Part of their pay was they got a daily rum ration. It was called a tot. And uh, to ensure that the water, the rum hadn't been watered down, what they would do is they would take the rum and they would soak gunpowder with it. <laughs> and then they would light the gunpowder on fire. Well, if the gunpowder burned, then that was proof that the whiskey had not been, or the rum had not been watered down sufficient or to the point where it wouldn't burn. Um, if, if it didn't burn, it was considered underproof. Well, so happens that whiskey or that rum and the rum had to be at least 57% alcohol by volume in order for the whiskey, for the, the gunpowder to burn. So in the UK, up until 1980, if you talked about 100 proof whiskey, that was a whiskey that was 57% alcohol by volume. In 1980, they changed all that over, went to ABV. So the US is usually, is pretty much the only uh, country in the world left that still uses proof on the bottle. Um, so other things you'll find on the label, you'll see the term straight a lot on American whiskeys. This has nothing to do with the sexual proclivity of the distiller or the whiskey. Um, straight just means the whiskey's been aged at least two years. Okay. Uh, single cask or single barrel uh, means exactly what it says. The whiskey that's in the bottle came out of a single cask or a single barrel. If it uh, says cask strength or barrel proof, the bottle, the whiskey was not watered down or wasn't diluted down. It's the the proof that's in the bottle is exactly what came out of the cask. Um, bottle and bond is another expression for American whiskey. It's pretty interesting. It, um, we don't do it much anymore, but basically it was an American whiskey, usually a bourbon, that ha had to meet the criteria of being bottled by a single, a single distiller in a single season, aged for four years, and bottled at 50% ABV. Sour mash, we talked about that a little earlier. Again, if it says sour mash in the bottle, that just means they're using the sour mash process for, uh, for kicking off their fermentation. Small batch is a marketing term. Uh, back in the 19, late 1980s, Jim Beam came, came up with the term, the idea of small batch to indicate that the whiskey was a, a, a bottle, and the bottle was a blending of a small, a small batch of barrels. Um, small for Beam is relative because the uh, Basil Hayden, which is a bean product, is a small batch thing, and they, they blend like 40,000 barrels to create Basil Hayden. Um, craft is another word that doesn't really have a legal definition. It's usually used to, to indicate a small distillery, um, although, it, yeah, buyer beware. And then you'll see the term non-chill filtered on a bottle as well sometimes. Finishes. Finishes, you'll see the word a lot on the, uh, uh, with respect to uh, Scotch whiskeys. Um, Jim McEwen, who's the master distiller at Brooklot, he refers to this as a shit word. He says it's really it's alternate cask enhancement. Um, essentially what you're doing is you're taking the whiskey out of the cask that it's in, you're dumping it in a different style of cask, typically a, a sherry cask or some other fortified wine or rum cask, allowing it to age longer, maybe another two years or whatnot, before you then bottle it. Um, this is actually a sherry cask finished bottling right here. This is a, a single malt from uh, Westland, which is in Seattle, Washington, uh, where they've done a, a single malt whiskey, then put it in a sherry cask and let it age further. It's usually pretty easy to tell a sherry cask because they'll be nice and red. Um, it's a beer barrel aged bourbon. Yeah, beer barrel. Uh, they, they took a bourbon and aged dragon Yeah. Yep. They've, uh, it's, there's, there's quite a, a lot of that going on um, where you'll take a, a, a bourbon distillery, will take barrels and pass them off to, a, to a, a brewer. The brewer will then put aged beer in that barrel and sell it as a, you know, in Texas, RAR has a, um, does a, what they call a bourbon barrel winter warmer. Um, Jameson just in the last month has, has released something called Cask Mates where they took, a, they took their Irish whiskey barrels, gave them to a local distiller or a local brewer who filled the barrels with a stout, aged it for six months, emptied it, gave the whiskey barrels back to Jameson, who then dumped whiskey back in the barrels, <laughs> aged it for another six months, and then they're selling that. It's called Cask Mates. So, uh, again, yeah. 
it's an interesting stuff. So glassware and whiskey, um, this, this is the iconic, this is a Glencairn glass, Looks like this one up here. This is the iconic Scotch glass. They're de all designed for a very specific, re uh, with a, a very specific way. Um, the idea is to, for the, is to uh, it holds a fair amount of whiskey. You can get a good two ounces in there, but the, the neck, the way the whiskey necks down is designed to concentrate the aroma of the whiskeys right at the nose of the glass, okay? Uh, or right at the neck of the glass, so you, you get a good, a good whiff of it. Um, I like this glass, it's called the grappa glass. Um, this is what we actually used to do all of our sensory work at the, at the distillery. Um, there's also a Capita nosing glass. Uh, and then if you, you wanna drink it, you know, other than straight, there's the typical rocks glass. So drinking it um, straight or neat, uh, most whiskeys are actually distilled and, and proofed to the point where they're designed to be drank straight. Okay. Um, however, comma, barrel slash cast strength caution. Some barrel strength whiskeys or cast strength whiskeys can be pretty stout to try to drink. You know, 62% by alcohol um, can be kind of rough on you. Um, water, uh, I encourage people to put a, a drop or two of water in the whiskey. It, there's an actual chemical reaction that occurs when you do that. It actually um, opens the whiskey up. It'll knock the ethanol down. You'll get a lot more fruity esters and, uh, and floral scents out of the whiskey. And when I mean a drop, I mean just a drop, okay? I'm not talking about dumping a half a glass of, you know, a half a bottle of water in there. You can also drink whiskey on the rocks. Um, a lot of back and forth about this, whether this is good or not, because the ice does, the, the cold does actually influence the flavor. If you're gonna dr drink it on the rocks, the big ice balls work the best because basically the whiskey gets chilled when it gets dumped on the top, but then there's not a lot of contact between the whiskey and the, and the ice after that, so it doesn't, you don't get, it doesn't get watered down. And then if you don't want to drink it straight, then there's always cocktails, right? Nothing like a good Manhattan or, a, or an old fashioned. So um, picking, up, picking a whiskey, if you, if you decide to, if you're trying to find a whiskey, there's a lot of guys out there who write tasting notes, okay? This, it's all very subjective. Okay, what one person gets in a whiskey, another person may or may not get the same thing. If you find a writer that writes notes that you agree with or you find that are, are, are along your palate, then stick with that guy, okay, and, that, and use, use that as a, as a guide. However, be aware that you are susceptible, okay. It's, it's, aromas and whiskeys are basically tied to your memories, okay, and you're going to be susceptible to, um, to, be, to suggestion. So when I do tastings with people, you know, I, I never say anything about what I'm getting until somebody else says something. But as soon as somebody says, oh, I get, I, I can smell cherry blossoms or something like that, everybody in the room can smell cherry blossoms if they know what cherry blossoms smell like. Now, if you don't, if you never smelled them, you won't pick that up. So um, whiskey clubs. There are a lot of whiskey clubs out there. The club I go to typically every Friday night, um, this is what the table looks like. <laughs> Okay, um, and most whiskey clubs are more than happy to, to it welcome you in. Doesn't cost you anything. You have the opportunity to, to try all different kinds of whiskeys, um, and if you know if you're fortunate, there'll be guys that are, are knowledgeable in what's going on there that will help you through anything you want to know about whiskeys. All right, um, or find a good whiskey bar. Uh, most good whiskey bars will actually uh, they'll do flights, so you can they'll, they'll have preset flights that'll be like six ounce, six half ounce pours. Um, that you can go through uh, for relatively inexpensive price and it'll give you a wide range of whiskeys to, to try. So when you first approach a whiskey, you know, um, eyeball it. And by that I mean get the whiskey in the glass and swirl it around the glass and look at it through the light and, and just like you look for legs in wine, look for the legs in the whiskey. That'll give you an indication of what the mouth feels gonna be like. If it's real slow coating the glass and, and running down the glass, that's a good indication it's gonna be kind of oily and it should have a really good smooth mouth feel. Nose it. Okay, now when I say nose it, it's just, I, I, I do this all the time. I, t I tell people to nose the whiskey and they do this, you know. It's like, no, I'm not talking about nose, I'm not get your nose in the glass, okay? Now, don't stick your nose in the glass and go <laughs> Okay, because if you do, all you're gonna do is burn off all the sensors in your nose, okay? When you do that, nose in the glass, open your mouth, breathe through your mouth, okay? When you inhale through your mouth, it'll draw, it'll draw air through your nose, okay? And you'll get, you'll get the, a lot of the flavor, you won't get a lot of the ethanol, okay? So you won't burn, burn your nose out. Um, obviously taste it, and by I say taste it, I don't mean just you know, stick it in your mouth and swallow it. Get in your mouth, swirl it around. You got thousands of taste receptors in your, in, in your tongue, you know, exercise all of them, all right? There's a, a guy named Richard Patterson who says that basically you should keep the whiskey in your mouth one second for every year old the whiskey is. Um, then when you finish it, um, You're looking for basically the after effects of that. 
when you finish it, open your mouth a little bit and draw a little bit of air into your mouth. Don't, don't do a big just a little bit, okay? That'll help oxidize what's left in your mouth and it'll actually it'll change up the flavor profile quite a bit. The other thing is take your time, okay? Whiskeys are designed to be drank over 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes. The whiskey will change in the glass. The longer it sits in the glass, it starts to oxidize and you'll get all sorts of different flavors. Hangovers, all right? A lot, there's no real scientific consensus about why people get hangovers. Um, although it should be pretty apparent from the word, okay? Alcohol is a toxin, <laughs> all right? When you drink this stuff, you're, po it's, you're dumping poison into your body. Um, one of the byproducts of the metabolism of ethanol is, is, is acetaldehyde. All right, acetaldehyde is a relative of formaldehyde. Um, acetaldehyde is, uh, is one of those things that, um, again, it's, it's toxic to your body and it's one of the key contributors to, uh, to, to a hangover. Um, the other thing is they found that there's a chemical co compounds called cytokines that are released in your body. These are the things that result in the flu-like symptoms that you have with a hangover, okay? Um, so the headache, the nausea, those types of things, this all comes from these, these chemicals called cytokines. Um, the other thing is, is that there's a lot of people talk about dehydration being a, 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 a cause for a hangover. Not really. Okay. It contributes, but it's not the cause. So basically what happens when you drink, um, alcohol is a diuretic, makes you, makes you pee. It does that because it suppresses vasopressin, which is, a, is an enzyme in your, in your blood uh, that causes your kidneys to essentially store water. Well, when you suppress that, you hit the threshold, and that threshold is at the point in time where you start dancing around and you've got to find a bathroom, right? That's when the floodgates open and, and you just pee continuously. All right. um, well, when you dehydrate your body like that, then your body combats it by starting to squeeze down blood vessels to, to, to slow the flow of, of, of blood around your body. Well, when that happens, your brain starts to dilate all the blood vessels in, in the brain to get oxygen and water to the brain, which puts pressure on your skull, which gives you a headache. So. So how to avoid a hangover? Well, don't get drunk, okay? I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. Just don't, don't, I mean, you can drink and not get drunk. I do it, I do it every Friday night, okay? Um, in Texas, if you're a concealed hanging license holder, there is no legal limit, okay? If they pull you over and they test you and you're like 0.01% alcohol content or in your blood, bang, you're going to jail. Yeah, so I'm a CHL holder. I'm not about to get pulled over, so I can drink all night and not get drunk. So keep food in your stomach, particularly fatty things, right? Your stomach doesn't do real well at, at absorbing alcohol, um, not near as efficient as your intestines are. Well, if you keep food in your stomach, then the pyloric valve in your stomach, between your stomach and your intestines stays closed. And so rather than the alcohol flooding into your intestines, it just trickles in so that you don't absorb it as fast. Drink slower, all right? Strongly flavored drinks, so if you drink, if you drink things that are strongly flavored, you tend to drink them slower, okay, as opposed to vodka, which has no flavor, which people pound, and then they wonder why they get drunk. Um, avoid carbonation. Carbonation actually speeds up the, the absorption of alcohol into your blood system, unless you're drinking slower. And they found that most people who drink carbonated be beverages actually do drink slower than non-carbonated beverages. Avoid diet sodas. Diet sodas will cause your stomach to empty 75% faster than a regular soda will. So if you're going to drink your drink with diet sodas or with, a, with carbonated soda, use the full leaded stuff. Don't, don't go with the diet thing, okay? If you do all those things, then hopefully you'll avoid what Rum Kitty's problem is here. <laughs> so Gaelic uh, is basically means good health. Remember what whiskey will not cure. There is no cure for. And uh, down there in the corner, please do drink responsibly. Thank you.